say all glory, all honor, all power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. We thank you this morning that, that our prayers and our worship and our ministry arises to you like incense. And it pleases your heart and you respond to the prayers of your people and you respond to our cries for, for mercy and grace and help and love and, and peace. Lord, thank you for the priestly ministry this morning. Anoint us to lift our voice. Anoint us to come before you in prayer. Lord, we ask you to pour out a spirit of prophecy in our midst. Holy Spirit, we lean into you that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And because we have ears to hear, we would have grace to overcome, grace to love you well in our spheres of influence. We ask that you would enlighten the eyes of our hearts this morning. Father of glory, pour out your glory and enlighten the eyes of of our hearts. We ask you for your light and your truth to shine forth from your holy sanctuary. Your light and your truth to pierce the darkness again. Your light and your truth to lead us to the knowledge of God. Holy Spirit, help your bride today to cling to the hope of your return, to the hope of the resurrection, to the hope of eternal life. Show us again your glorious inheritance in your saints. Show us again the exceedingly great power you have for those who believe. The power that raised you from the dead, the power that sat you at the right hand of the Father. Jesus, we look to you. We thank you that you are above all authority, you are above every throne, you are above every principality. There is no one as high and lifted up as you. We thank you that you call us your body, and this is who we are. And through us, you fill the earth with glory. The fullness of him fills all in all. You fill the earth with the knowledge of God. Lord, we ask you this day, stretch out your hand and give us boldness. Boldness to fill the earth. Stretch out your hand. Let signs and wonders be done. In the name of the Holy Servant, Jesus. And fill us with your spirit and fill us with boldness in our generation. Boldness to make you know. Power to show forth your glory. We bless you in this place. As we worship, as we sing, as we fall down, as we lift our hands, as we dance, we bring you glory. We honor you. We focus all of our attention on you. We set our eyes on you. Let them be singular today. Let them be healthy today, beholding the King of glory. Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
presence. Thank you for your nearness. Thank you for your glory, Lord. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your nearness. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your nearness. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your nearness. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your nearness. Thank you for your glory, Lord. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your nearness. Thank you for your glory.
to see See you rightly, Jesus I want to see I want to see See you rightly, Jesus Spirit of wisdom Open my eyes again
Jesus, you're beautiful. Jesus, you're beautiful. Jesus, you're beautiful. Jesus, you're beautiful. Your nature, your character, your ways, or oh, your leadership is beautiful. Every time I hear your voice, my heart leaps and says, beauty, 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 glory, 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 Jesus, you're beautiful. If we could only see the man with the eyes like a flame a fire, we fall down before his glory and say, A sacrifice, a sacrifice. 
still deserve it. I give you my worship, cause you still deserve it. I give you my worship, cause you forever deserve it. I give you my devotion, cause you forever deserve it. I give you my obedience, cause you forever deserve it. I give you my love, Lord, for you forever deserve it. I give you all and all glory, all power, for you forever deserve it. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Wow. You just set your eyes on Jesus right now. He is worthy. He is holy. I was telling some people this morning, I, when I woke up, I just heard these, these words, let the glory of the Lord rise among us. And so, Lord, we just say right now, Lord, let your glory rise among us. Lord, that we would, as Moses prayed, Lord, that we would behold your glory. Let us see your glory. Lord, I thank you that you said in Matthew, you said, blessed are those who have eyes to see, ears to hear. But open the eyes of our heart to see. We don't have to have it all figured out. We don't have to be the smartest, the strongest, the fastest. We just have to have our eyes set on Jesus. We just have to hear his voice. We just have to be sheep. How simple it is. Yet the distractions of this world, the loud noises, the things that would pull us away, that we'd set our gaze on other things. Lord, we just say, may we not be distracted. May we not look at other things and have any other longing other than the longing to see your face, to behold your glory, to be in your presence. Lord, I thank you that it's from that place that we live in the fullness of the life that you have for us. You created us in your image. And you say, when you behold me, you'll become like me. When you look at me, you become who you're to be. From glory to glory. And it says it comes by the Spirit. So we say, Spirit of the living God. Would you move in our hearts? Would you awaken us, enlighten us? Kevin, where's Kevin? I just feel like this, I was just saying there's a fire. I feel like this awakening fire right now to just, that we, we step in to what may not even make sense right now. Because we don't operate from our own mindset. We operate from a place of trusting in the Lord as we hear his voice. And we thank you, Lord, that your word is going forth. It's still going forth. It doesn't return void. There's a scripture real quick before Kevin shares. In Isaiah 55, the Lord had me in this this morning. It says, as the heavens are higher from the earth... So are my ways from your ways. Lord, I ask right now for an alignment with your ways, with your heart, with your nature, with your character, with who you are. It says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, even as we're experiencing this rain today, 
and says, and it does not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And by the way, the next part is as he sends his word, he sends you to be carriers of the word to release the glory of the Lord on the face of the earth. And it says the next words after that, you're going to go out with joy. You'll be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into song before you and the trees of the field will clap their hands. It says instead of the thorn bush will grow the pine tree. Instead of the, the briar, the myrtle will grow. And it will be for the Lord's glory, for his renown, for his fame, for an everlasting sign which will not be destroyed. Lord, we thank you that your glory is covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. Lord, we thank you that you're doing it through your people. Jesus' prayer was that the glory of the Lord, that his glory would be given to us for the unity, for the oneness. Lord, may we cover the earth with your glory. May we go out. May we go out with joy. May we be, be led forth with peace. By the way, that is the fruit of the Spirit. And as we walk in step with the Spirit, as he sets his Spirit within us, there is his love, his joy, his peace. It goes out into the earth. It re it's released we thank you for the unity that only comes by the Spirit. There's another piece to this with the fire, though. I'm going to just let Kevin share. And Tracy, if you'll just come up and release what you were hearing. So in worship, I, God showed me something I saw a couple months ago where the veil from one side of the sanctuary to the other was torn. And I just kept hearing, behold the glory of the Lord, behold the glory of the Lord, behold the glory of the Lord. And when I was in worship, he reminded me of that today. But behind the veil this morning, I saw Jesus standing ablaze. He was full of fire. He was, cons he was a consuming fire. And the sense of the Spirit was saying that when you come behind the veil, don't fear the fire. Don't fear my fire. Stay with me in the fire. And I thought of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were in the fire. God appeared and spoke to them in the fire. And he's wanting to meet with us in the fire. And I just, two quick scriptures and then I'm done. You can just hear this. Exodus 24, 17. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. And that's when Moses, then it says Moses went up into it and the rest of the children of Israel were afraid. But as you know, in Hebrews 12, the invitation is to not be afraid. God doesn't want us to be afraid. He says, come behind the veil into the fire of my glory. And then the first three verses of 2 Chronicles 7, when they're dedicating the temple, hear this prophetically for you personally, beloved, because we are his temple in the new covenant. He says, when Solomon had finished, this is 2 Chronicles 7, 1 through 3. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. Make our, yourself an offering before the Lord and let his fire consume you. It says, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Again, that's us. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel, verse 3, when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped, saying, praise the Lord. Beloved, the Lord does not want us to fear the fire. He's sensitizing us to his fire that he's pouring out. It's coming in measure that we cannot contain. It's going to be a wildfire in our lives, in our hearts, and through us in the earth. And God is saying, come behind the veil into me as a consuming fire. I'm inviting you not to fear it. I'm going to speak with you. I'm going to meet with you. And my glory like fire will consume you to release it in the earth.
speaking at the conference uh, up at Bridgeway this last week and the last couple of weeks to the Lord. I just kept hearing it and I heard it again this morning. God kept saying love will lead the way. The whole conference was about the prophetic and prophecy. And I just want to take you a couple of things and I'm just going to release a prayer. 1 Corinthians 12, where all the gifts are. Verse 31 says this, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. And now I will show you the most excellent way. He didn't say a more excellent way or let me show you a better path or it said, I'm going to show you the most excellent way. Anytime you hear the Lord say in his word, and now I will show you whatever's to come next is the very foundation that's established in that, in that verse. And sure enough, verse 13 talks all about love. It says, love never fails, right? And without love, we're, we are nothing, nothing. And by the way, in the Greek, nothing means nothing. And then it says this in verse 14, verse 1. This is that love will lead the way. It says this, follow the way of love and eagerly desire the spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. <laughs> what I spoke on Friday is this. The old covenant confusion is being broken off. No longer does someone hear for us, speak for us. It was man that established those things. Moses, you're the guy. You're the one that will hear. You're the one that will go. Many were invited to go up the mountain. But they said, no, we elect Moses. Over and over, but that's an old covenant. We're in the new covenant. And Paul said it, along with the Lord. I wish more than anything that you prophesy, more than any of these other gifts that you prophesy. God is raising up a prophetic army and it's all going to be birthed out of love. We have the opportunity to eavesdrop on the conversations of heaven if we'll just open our heart and love with intimacy. John Washington Carver said this, this is a quote, he said, if you love anything long enough, it'll share its secrets with you. Lord, I thank you that you are literally dying <laughs> and dying to share the secrets of heaven with us. You love all of your children, but you don't trust all of your children. And when we love you in intimacy, Lord, there's a trust that's created, Lord, where you start to download and you start to release what heaven is saying over your people. So God, I just pray right now for God, a baptism in the spirit of love over your people, Lord. God, the very intimacy, God, that's breeding anointing in this hour, Lord. It's the anointing, God, that will birth breakthrough, God. It's that, that Isaiah 58 breakthrough where the chains will be broken off of the bride, God, and that Jesus himself will say, stand, my son, stand, my daughter, and speak. I'm going to give you new mind. I'm going to fill your lungs with the breath of heaven. Amen. I'm just going to take communion here as we worship. And how beautiful that even next, as Tracy was just talking in about 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 11 talks about the communion. And this communion with Jesus as we just come before him and re this is that remembrance of, of this new covenant, of what we have. And I just feel like today as we take this, that the, the cry of our heart would be, Lord, open the eyes of our heart. Open the eyes of our heart to see you. We need to see him. We have to have our eyes on him. If we're not seeing him and if we're not hearing him, 
it's, it's not going to go well for us. <laughs> the, the scripture in, in Matthew 13, it says this. Jesus says these words, and uh, he's quoting Isaiah. And he says, for, the, for this people's heart, they became calloused. And no, I just want to catch the heart part. I just feel like there's a, just a focus on the heart right now. For the people's heart had become calloused. And from a calloused heart, it says they could hardly hear with their ears and they had their eyes closed. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears. And then from that place, it says, and then they would understand with their hearts and they would turn and the Lord would heal them. It says any, in 2 Corinthians 3, it says anyone who turns to the Lord, the veil is removed there's a new covenant for his people, but it requires that understanding heart, eyes open, ears hearing. And then he says this, he said, blessed are your eyes because they see, and blessed are your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and the righteous men, they longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but they did not hear it. And then he goes into this parable, and the first thing he says is he says, anyone who hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, he was talking about the understanding of the heart, having eyes to see and ears to hear, says the evil one will come and will snatch away what was sown in his heart. This is how important that position of the heart is. So would you just put your hands on your heart as we just prepare to receive communion here? Uh, you know, it's not just about a tradition of just doing something. There's something greater. And so uh, today, let there be a cry of your heart to remove any of the callousness, anything that would be hardened that our eyes would be open. And, and I was, eyes and ears, I'm not talking about eyes, ears. I'm talking about it's the understanding of the heart, the eyes and ears of the heart, so that we would know and understand and have the mind of the Spirit because everything that the Lord gives us is spiritually discerned. And without the, without the mind of the Spirit, without that understanding heart, without eyes and ears, to see and to hear. The enemy is able to come and snatch away the very things that the Lord has for us, the very words that he has, the very things that he has for us to do in this season. And so, Lord, I ask right now for that tenderness of our hearts. Lord, let there be a cry of our heart to be in alignment with your heart, that there would be a tenderness in our heart. And, Lord, we know that, that can we go throughout the week and and things can come up and it's like they bombard us and we're, we're kind of get distracted and our minds off of you and we're looking at other things. Lord, I pray for a reset this morning. I pray that you would blow away the fog where, where there's confusion, where there's misunderstanding. Lord, I thank you for this spirit of love, this this power, this love, this sound mind that you give us, Lord, where fear would come in. Fear, it says, if those worries and concerns, it's one of the very things that chokes out the fruitfulness of life. But Lord, we thank you for the power, your love. We thank you for the sound mind. We thank you for the mind of the Spirit, that our heart would not be hardened, that when you speak to us, we would listen. We would have ears to hear. Lord, open the eyes of our heart. Give us ears to hear. In Hebrews, it says this. It says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as they did in the rebellion. It says it a number of times. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts comes from that place of unbelief, of disobedience. Talks about it in Hebrews 3, 4. 
as, as Tracy's talking about this love, you've, you've heard Heidi Baker, she goes, love looks like something. Love isn't just a stagnant, like, feeling. Love actually is a response to the commands to say yes. It's Mother's Day, and, and when mom says, hey, go do this, what do we do? Yes, mom. <laughs> we go do it. Why? Because we love our moms. Lord, I thank you that you're awakening your church that when you speak, we don't go, yeah, we love you, <laughs> and then stay where we are. But, Lord, we, we walk in your ways, and from that, we get to behold your face. We get to behold your glory. So we lift you up this morning. May you be lifted up. May the glory of the Lord rise among yes. us today. Yes. Would you show yourself? that we would behold you. And it's in that place, that's where we are transformed into your likeness. Lord, we want to be transformed. Yes. We don't want to conform. <laughs> we want to be transformed. There's a big difference. Transformed is a metamorphosis that changes us, that, that we, you can't go back. It's like it shifts everything on the inside of you. Conforming is from the outside, and it like pressures you and, and tries to conform you into something. That's what the world does. God transforms. He changes us from the inside. Thank you, Jesus. So... Lord, we thank you. Just a second here. We're going we to take communion. Lord, I just, let us take that moment just to prepare our hearts. Lord, to come before you, even before we take communion, that we would just take that moment. If there's, if there's anything in our heart, it's like we can't get rid of it on ourselves. What we do is it says you turn to the Lord, and it rips down the veil. It removes those things. We just turn to him. It's in the place of repentance. It's like turning from your own way to his way. And there's this times, the times of refreshing. He refreshes us. He renews us. When we take communion with him, it's, a, it's his body. It's his blood. There's a cleansing from all unrighteousness. There's a washing. So, Lord, we just prepare our hearts right now. Lord, if there's any unclean thing, if there's anything in our hearts, we run to you. It's not a condemnation, but there is sometimes that conviction of the heart. Lord, would you convict our heart that we would have clean hands, pure hearts, to send the holy hill. We need to have the clean hands and the pure heart so we can see, so we can hear, so we can have an understanding heart. Thank you, Jesus. So, Lord, we take your body, which has been broken for us. We thank you that you are the bread of life. Yes. Thank you. There's nothing more more precious than to take the body of Christ, the bread of life, to take the cup of the new covenant, to take the blood of Jesus. It says, with it we have eternal life. So we take hold of you this morning. We behold you this morning. Lord, I pray that as we take communion, Lord, that you would complete that just softening of our hearts that you would restore, renew, and make whole. As Tracy said, that we would have that, that love that only comes from you, that comes by your spirit. That would be the way of our life, that we would live from that place of love. It never fails. Never fails. Lord, burn a fire in us.
just as Kevin was saying, I just felt it's all connected. It's that we're burning out the dross. Anything in there that is hardened, let it begin to burn off right now. Let your glory be revealed in each one of us. Let the glory of the Lord rise upon us. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Let's just take communion. You guys can come up. Uh, you can pray together. You can just, maybe it's just you and the Lord right now. You want to come up and just get on your knees before the Lord. Let's just stand up as we declare this song. And as we wrap up worship here, I just want to finish with this song and let it be a, not just a song, but actually let it be a declaration over your families, over this place, over your workplaces, over Colorado, over this nation, that in this time that we are going to see the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let's sing that. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the presence of our King rise among us. Let it rise. 
Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the presence of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the presence of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, and oh, let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the presence of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, one more time. Let the glory of the Lord rise. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the presence of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Just stay standing for a minute. We just want to love on the, the moms. Uh, if you see a mom around you, would you just lay a hand on them? We're going to just pray over the moms. Gideon, will you come up here? As far will you come up here as well? We just have the opportunity. We're going to pray over these amazing moms all over the room here. Some don't have their hands laid on here, but lay hands on each other. <laughs> A lot of moms around there. Yeah, just come together there. All right. Would you just agree in prayer? I asked uh, just a couple people just to pray this morning. I'm going to have Gideon just lead us off in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for these, this day. Thank you for all the moms around and Lord, thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. And Lord, um, I pray that we all um, we will all fall before you and get to know you more, Lord. God, we thank you just for the ministry that mothers live out, God, just raising up the next generation to walk with you and to know you, Lord. We just thank you for that important role that they play in the earth, God, and we just bless them, the spiritual mothers, God, the future mothers, the mothers and the grandmothers, God. We just pray that you would bless them today, God. Would you bless their children, God, and the generations after them, Lord. We just thank you for how much you love them, God, and how important they are to you, God. And we just pray a blessing over all the mothers here today in Jesus' name. This is Pastor Joe here from uh, Freedom Church down in Colorado Springs. Father, we just thank you for every mother in this place. And God, we just bless them. 
Uh, God, I just ask you just to fill them just with a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit, uh, just for peace over their minds, over their souls, Father. That, and I just declare today is going to be the best day of their lives, and it's just going to continue getting better. Better. If there's any kind of separation between any of their kids, Father, somehow that reconciliation would take place, that restoration would take place, that, uh, I don't know if it's got to be a phone call made, a text to be made, a conversation through somebody else, but that connection, and we just thank you for it in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I'm just going to pray a blessing, So, uh, and then there's just one thing on my heart to do after that. So, Lord, we just bless each mama, each woman. I I always say to our youth, we're always leading someone somewhere, and and it's true for our moms. It's true for our younger to-be moms and all those in between. God, we just bless them this morning. I thank you for their yes to you. I thank you for their covenant relationship with you first, Jesus, and then with their families, their children. But Lord, let us lead in a way that walks with humility. Let us be those that lay our lives down and as examples of what it looks like to follow Jesus, the one who gave his whole life just for us, God. So thank you, Jesus, that we get to walk like that. And, um, and ladies in the house, this is something we've been praying in the youth, and I want to pray this over our men. We are, we are believing that God is calling the men in the house of the Lord to rise up in this season. And so I just want to say that we have a, um, an authority to say yes to what God's doing, to have the men join alongside. I feel like they've been backseated. They've been made fun of too long, and they've been disregarded, and our dads in our houses, I'm just calling them forth into the house of the Lord in this season. So, Lord, we thank you for the men of the, of the of God that are walking with you and those that aren't yet walking with you or have walked away. We call them back in and we say we honor the men of the Lord. We honor you and we say step into your rightful place as sons of God. So we call you back into the house. I just felt like the Lord said it's time to pick up your sword again. So I feel like it's that call of the Lord that says, hold on to the sword. Take that place where the Lord has called you to fight for families. And so, Lord, we just say, may the men of God say yes to the assignment over their lives, to fight for the authority that you've given them, to stand and to take ground in the kingdom of God here on earth. As we were just saying, it's here on earth. Our assignment is on earth where destiny is heaven, but we're here now. So we're called to fight. So Lord, we just say yes as, as moms and young women and young, uh, young men. We bless our fathers especially too. I know that's kind of a flip, but we say yes, Lord. We call them into the house. We thank you for them, Lord. And we thank you that we get to be those that as husbands and wives, we get to lock arms as we're walking with the Lord. We get to come into unity as we help one another say yes. Thank you, Jesus. My heart is so full. We love these mamas, and we thank you, God, for the heart that you've given them to say yes and to pray. We have some praying moms in this house. If you didn't know that, it is true. We have some praying moms. So in the name of Jesus, everybody said amen. (laughs) I love that. Hey, let me just say, as as a father, as a husband, for you moms, you know, sometimes you can get frustrated with your, your husbands and, or maybe your, your sons, and you're like, come on. And what happens is you're trying to get them to rise up, but what you're doing is you're speaking what you see over them and not who they are. And I promise you, if you begin to declare who they are to be, and you begin to pray into that, there will be a shift. Uh, it, it may, you may not see it in the moment, but you begin to speak life over them instead of saying, you're always doing this or you're always doing that. And kind of like just, it, it's, it, let me just say, that doesn't help. But if you can say, man, I see this in you. I see who you are. And you begin to speak life, like not into their head so much as into their spirit, something's going to begin to shift. Something's, it's going to begin to rise up. Talking about uprising, I just want to... <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you come up here for a second and just share. There, well, there's a men's conference coming up in the springs here, and, and Pastor Joe is leading it. And so I was like, well, what better time? And here we are. Christy's praying into it. We're talking about 
the men rising. I know this is Mother's Day, so, <laughs> but um, I, I think probably for moms, you're like, yeah, if I can, if I can get that man to rise up and step into the fullness, like that's the best present ever, right? <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to just have Pastor Joe just talk about it for a minute. All right, so uh, my wife, Tess, if you want to stand up. <laughs> and then actually, Daniel and Lauren. So Daniel and Lauren are on our board. They're part of our church. Stand up. Give them a hand. Thank you. So um, I stole the name. If Men, it's, it's, it's not a specifically a gender-specific book. Women, I believe you'd be blessed by it. But men, if you've not read the book called Uprising by Chris Valentin, I would say please read the book. My wife and I have a, we actually, the, co the church also has a coffee shop, and we have it in the middle of town. And um, I, I've done, I'm in my fourth time of, the book is 16 weeks, I'm doing a 16-week small group for men. And we've had as many as 40 and 50 men in there on, the, on our conference side of our coffee shop, and it's just changing the lives of men. And Man, it's just, you know, so much of the time, we are not without sin. And so, and so much of the time, people want to see justice, and God's like, restoration. And it's, a, and it's about restoring these relationships. And so, anyway, the conference is May 31st, June 1st. We meet in, we're actually, our church in Woodland Park, and we meet in Andrew Almack's beautiful facility. Uh, we've been in there for the last few years. Thank God for a relationship with him. So, so there's 3,200 seats in this, and there's, there's 1,100-plus parking spots in the garage alone. So there's plenty of room. <laughs> Come on. Give him a hand, will you? Yeah, fill it up, Lord, 3,200 down there. That would be awesome. <laughs> um, tell you what, we're going to receive offering, tithes and offerings here. Um, so let's do this. You guys can stay seated, but we're going to just declare this together. There's a declaration. We do this every once in a while. We'll just declare. And then as we end the declaration, if you haven't done this before, we just yell out hallelujah, which is a glorious song in praise to the creator. So, so let's just declare this together. We have a number of these we put up, and uh, I don't know which one we have. So here we go. We're going to we're going to declare it together out loud. Ready? Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Thank you for generously blessing me. You have a divine purpose for my life, and you supply all I need to fulfill my heavenly calling according to the riches of your glory in Christ Jesus. Father, I desire to please you with my giving and to be a good steward of what you have given me. Show me your truth your ways, and your purposes regarding wealth and money. <laughs> you are my God, and I serve you alone. Money works for me that I might abound in every good work. May the name of our Lord Jesus Christ be glorified, and may this glory be revealed in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Amen. By the way, we have a guest speaker with us who is amazing. Uh, I've got to be with him for the past few days. Maybe some of you have as well. Uh, but uh, I was going to say Pastor Ben Armstrong. I know he, he has a lot of different names, prophetic, <laughs> uh, prophet. Uh, but uh, but uh, Ben Armstrong, he is a, he's on the, the leadership team, the senior leadership team at, at Bethel in Reading, and, uh, and is just doing, um, they're doing amazing things. If you know Bethel, um, you, guys, you guys ever heard of Bethel? <laughs> uh, so we're just honored and blessed to have Ben here uh, on Mother's Day, and yeah. so we just want to bless their family, his wife, Heather, his children, uh, he'll probably talk about them for a minute or so, or a couple minutes. Um, but but uh, Ben is the overseer of the prophetic ministry at Bethel Church. Uh, and so there might be a little prophetic word that gets released here today. We'll see. Whatever the Lord has. Uh, he just has a passion for the Lord. He has a passion for people. Yeah. And, and I just say he walks in such humility. Um, it was beautiful yesterday. Uh, as we were at the conference, and, and there was just worship going on. Uh, do you have the, the picture? I took a picture on my phone, two pictures, and I actually, I don't know if you have them there. Oh, here we go. 
I just, I, this was, this is Ben here, and all the kids were coming up, and as, as worship was going on, Ben was just praying and prophesying over these young kids, and it was just a, it was such a beautiful thing to watch, uh, so maybe you'll be able to bring your kids up, and he might not prophesy over you, but he'll prophesy over <laughs> your kids, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> he loves your kids. <laughs> uh, so would you guys just give, give Ben a huge hand as he comes up and releases the word today? You made me cry. Oh. <laughs> uh, now those are, uh, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for kids. Like, uh, of course I'll pray over your children. Uh, it's so special. Sorry, I just was, I'm crying. Just need to catch myself for a second. I just got wrecked, you know, just from that. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you. That messed me up. Uh, hey, we, we want to come to church and be messed up, amen? Uh, in a good way, in a good way. Life's already messed up enough. You're like, Lord, mess me up in a good way. Reorganize it, redo it, make it right. Hey, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. What a privilege. I mean, this is incredible that you're having a, a, a father speak on Mother's Day. Um, so I, I really uh, appreciate the honor, and it's a, it's a special privilege. And uh, mothers are, are one of the greatest treasures on the planet. And, uh, you know, in old Celtic culture, there was something that mothers did on the wedding day for their daughters. Uh, fire in old Celtic culture, in old tribal cultures, fire was the ultimate gift. It was the ultimate thing to be stewarded. And what the mother would do, would she would, at the end of every night, she would heap the coals in her hearth up together. It was called smoring the fire, and she would take it and she would heap it up in a pile and so that in the morning, there would still be coals hidden in the pile of ashes that she would rekindle the fire every morning. And this was a family heirloom that was passed on to mother to daughter, mother to daughter. And on the wedding day of the daughter, she would mother would take coals from her own fire that was passed down from the generations and the daughter would start her fire in her hearth from a fire that had been going on for for generation after generation after generation and that is the gift of the mother you carry the fire of god and you heap it up and you know the christian celtic culture they would they would do three piles, one for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Spirit in their fire every night. And so I just want to honor the mothers in the house for being keepers of the flame and really the stewards, the ones who many times are the ones who are calling their husbands back, calling their sons and daughters back to, to a relationship with God. And they are the anchors in our life um, and, and mothers, you are so wonderful. Um, it's great. Thanks for hosting me, Christy, the mother of the house on Mother's Day, because this is, you're the boss of this day uh, here. So we, yeah, yeah. Well, um, can I share a picture of my family? Because I don't do this alone. This is a family ministry, and I'm here because they gifted me to you guys. It is Mother's Day. Oh, this is a wonderful picture. I'll start over here uh, uh, on my, my left over here in, in, uh, in the jeans, uh, jean pants, and, and the dark hair. That's Kira, Kira Noel. That's my 23-year-old daughter. And right next to her is Evan Riley, and that is her fiancé. 
and she is getting married next Saturday at our house. So it's crazy that I'm out of town with you guys and on Mother's Day. And Madison on the other end, Madison Kelly, she came, she's 21. She came to me. Uh, she said, Dad, what are you doing traveling on Mother's Day? What are we going to do? I said, baby, it's your mother, not my mother. <laughs> she's your mom. It's your now. I'm passing the baton. It is time for you to celebrate mom on your own. So they're doing a great Mother's Day brunch for, for my wife, and uh, it, it's wonderful. Actually, uh, the conference this weekend sent my wife flowers at home. And I'm just telling you, if you do a conference, send the wives flowers because the husbands feel treasured when you take care of their spouses, their kids. When you do something special for them, it is the best thing possible. Here's what's crazy. My wife, Heather, on Valentine's Day and Mother's Day, she volunteers at her best friend's flower shop because it is the biggest flower day of the year, Valentine's Day and Mother's Day. And she just volunteers because she loves serving our community. And she was at the flower shop and she gets a note for a flower delivery and she's writing all the cards and she starts writing it out and realizes she's writing the card to herself. <laughs> and she's, get, she's like, oh my goodness, I'm getting flowers. This is awesome. It was so special for her. So Madison on the far end and right next to her is her fiance, Jake, and they're getting married October 5th. I know, pray for my bank account. <laughs> Lord of the dance, two in one year. It is, it is incredible, it's amazing. They're super excited, uh, both girls. Um, and, you know, uh, we had this bright idea. Kira said, uh, the one getting married next week, and said, hey, how about this, Dad? How about we get married in the backyard? We have four acres, so, you know, we've got room enough for that, and we got this giant oak tree, and we're like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. Mom's like, no, don't do it. My wife is a professional uh, wedding photographer, and so she knows the work that it entails and all that. She's like, no, this is a bad idea. I'm like, no, baby, it's a great idea. We'll save money. <laughs> no, no, no. See, what you don't know is when you rent a venue, you get all the stuff. When you have it at your house, you have to rent all the stuff or buy all the stuff. And then you have to do work on your property. And it is... Talk about blood, sweat, and tears. I have gifted my daughter blood, sweat, and tears. Literally. I been, last week, I was working on my property, bleeding from barbed wire, trying to dig holes to put posts in for lights. And, and I'm sitting there weeping because I'm emotional because my daughter's getting married. And I am sweating, bleeding, and weeping. I'm like, oh, this is what it means, blood, sweat, and tears. But it was a joy. It's a gift. It's so exciting. Hey, right next to me, that's my 25-year-old son, Connor Benjamin Armstrong. And, uh, and he is not married. So all you single ladies will be taking applications afterwards. So I love... Uh, Ladies who love Jesus, and uh, that's what Connor needs. And then right next to me is my 21-year-old uh, wife, Heather Armstrong. She's not really 21, but she still looks 21. She is beautiful, gorgeous. And why do I share the family? Because it is, it's a family ministry. And I get to be here because they have gifted me to you guys. So I want, I want to make sure I'm always honoring them and honoring the mother of our family, Heather Armstrong. Hey, hey, amen. You can, you can keep it up all, all time, but you might stare at that and not pay attention to me. Uh, that was actually my 50th birthday this year, so it was super fun. It was the very first time in my life I've had a big birthday. So I, I just, 
I just don't do that. I just like, yeah, you know, let's hang out, let's go to dinner, something like that. Of course, I have a cake, German chocolate, every year. German chocolate cake, it's so good, vanilla ice cream. Like, I'm, I'm one of those guys. It's just like, hey, if it's good, don't, don't mess with it. Like, I just, I just, let's just stick with that. I'm loyal to German chocolate cake, <laughs> super loyal. Well, uh, they, Heather decided we're going to throw a big birthday party. And it, I, I had almost 100 people at my birthday party in our backyard, and it was super amazing, super fun. Until, and I'm having the, the time of my life. I'm thinking, man, I'm going to have birthdays like this more often. This is super fun. I get to see all my friends. I get to hang out until all of a sudden they sang happy birthday. I'm like, this is why I don't do this. I'm like, oh, that, that was the awkward moment when everyone's looking at you, everyone's singing happy birthday. At least they brought me a plate full of donuts. Oh, my second favorite thing, <laughs> donuts. I love donuts. Super fun. Uh, yeah, I, I want to pray for a group of people uh, in the room who uh, I, I want to pray for those of you who on Mother's Day, it's actually really rough um, because uh, you've, you've actually lost your mother or you have a broken relationship with, with mom. If that's you, I want you to stand to your feet. And I, I, wanna pr- I, I want us to pray over you. Um, yeah, good. Stand up. That's you. Okay. If you're next to one of these, church, let's be the church. Let's go find someone. Some of you might have to get out of your seat, but I want you to lay hands on them. God, you're you're the redeemer of that which was lost, stolen, and broken. And God, I ask that you would come, Spirit of God, as the comforter in this season to bring comfort where there seems to be maybe only pain. That God, you would come in a way that they've never experienced where there's broken relationship. God, I ask that there would be miraculous reconciliation that would come and surprise us, that there would be incredible breakthrough, that there would be incredible forgiveness, that God, that there would be a homecoming in this relationship. And for those of us that have lost our mothers, God, I pray that you would begin to restore relationships that actually bring in, I, I, I saw this picture in worship where God was bringing godmothers to people who had lost their mother. These godmothers who would actually be uh, mother figures in your life to invest in your life. So God, we thank you that you have a heart for every single one of these. And God, would you come and be their comforter, especially today, especially today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right. You can be seated. Um, Is the worship team in the room? I don't need them to come up and lead more worship. But yeah, you're you're the piano man. What's your name again? Jonathan. Jonathan. Great name. Uh, Great name. Jonathan. Hey, uh, Jonathan, while you were playing the piano, I looked up at you and I saw like... uh, um, you know, in the matrix, the, the, the kind of numbers or sy- symbols or code that was spinning down and dropping, I saw as you were playing, I saw revelation dropping into your head, and I saw a spirit of innovation and invention coming over you, and I saw God actually re- releasing certain formulas and crazy ideas 
And, uh, and some of the ideas, it was as if you were like, well, how, how am I going to accomplish this? If God will give you the idea about it, he'll also give you the revelation to accomplish that. He's not only the author or the beginner of our faith, he's the perfecter and finisher of it. And I believe God is actually going to uh, release new revelation for creative inventions, for creative ideas, and maybe even... Um, maybe even formulas that might be formulas to cures of things. So I, I see that over you, Jonathan, and we bless that in Jesus' name. Um, and then where's Luna? Is she still here? Luna. Oh, wait, why are you hiding way back there? Hi, hi, Luna. Um, Hey, when I, I, I looked up on stage, I, I saw you like Cinderella, Cinderella, and uh, I, I felt like um, there was a, a, actually a, a unique anointing on your life because uh, God was taking things that were uh, held against you, used against you, um, even broken things in your life, and God was actually creating this wonderful journey, this wonderful restoration, and this wonderful story of the testimony of the transformation that happens when you come into your royal identity. And, uh, and I felt like even that, you know, that, uh, that fairy godmother thing, I felt like uh, people were actually going to cling to you as a mother in their life, and I know you're, you're becoming a new mother. Uh, do you have more kids than that? Yeah, so you have, you, have, you have two? Two? Okay, and then this is your third? Oh, congratulations. I have three, too. We're like twins. Um, but I feel like this is even beyond your own children, that actually people will come to you as a counsel and come to you for identity, and there's a prophetic anointing to call out young women into their, into their royal identity. And so I, I just bless you with that prophetic grace on your life. And maybe you should watch Cinderella again just to get inspired even more so because I think God might unlock, consider watching it because he, he might unlock some things for you and show you some new secrets you never saw before in that. So bless you. Luna. And, and I like your name, Luna, right? Um, I'm a dreamer. So I, I just bless your dream and your, your night season with God. And that, that would be a special place of revelation and intimacy with the Lord. And I say no to anything that would try and steal away your sleep and your rest. That God, you would actually place angels around her house. And even for your children, even for your children, that this would be a natural place of grace and protection. So we say no to any nightmares, night terrors, or anything where the enemy tries to steal away the gift of dreams on your family's life. So we bless you guys and your husband hiding there. Thank you. Um, Tracy, uh, you tried to steal my sermon. I see that. I'm like, I'm like, come on, don't do that. Jeez, these prophetic guys who just like, oh, I'm, I, I feel something in the air. Yeah, I'm preaching it. <laughs> no, that's good. Tracy, uh, hey, I, I, I looked at you and you reminded me of a, a friend of mine, David Stein. And he, uh, David Stein is a beautiful pioneer. He, he used to plant churches, but he's always been a businessman. And he's always had this incredible grace uh, for business and what he's doing right now for our church. He's on our senior leadership team. But what he's doing is he's uh, running our capital project, you know, our big building project. And I saw an anointing on you for, for building and business. And there's this kind of thing of like, God, well, I, I love the church. I love this. I feel called to this. But there's there's I think God's not saying there's one or the other for you. I think there's a grace for both on your life. And God wants to bless both, and he wants to accelerate both in this season. Uh, does that make sense at all? Okay, a little bit. 
A little bit. Okay. One day I'm going to be prophetic. So, all right. We bless you with that, uh, Tracy. Uh, yeah. Um, and I, I don't know about this, but uh, uh, China, I, I feel like uh, there's going to be an open door to Asia uh, and, and you're going to uh, have an open door to go and, and do ministry there. And God's going to open up Asia to you, um, it's especially uh, like China, uh, Japan, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Southeast Asia. Um, so look for that as well, okay? There's going to be a new, new grace for that. All right. Sorry, i just doing some business. But you know, isn't it wonderful hearing what God thinks about people? Isn't it wonderful? Uh, what's this lady's name right here? Um, she, yeah, your wife? Yeah. Courtney? Courtney? Um, a, uh, I felt like, uh, sorry, I just, God's talking. Uh, Courtney, um, you're, you're actually the type of mother who you have a gift uh, for not just mothering, but I, I, I see everything you touch turns to gold. And I feel like there is this anointing on your life to coach, to counsel, to train, and to equip the, the uh, not even younger generation, but there's a real entrepreneurial spirit on you and on your life. And I, I feel like God, I e even saw you training people in business and business ideas. And I don't know if any of this makes sense. It doesn't have to, because it could be foretelling. I'm just telling your future. But um, <clears throat> I, I just said, I, I felt like God said this. There's been questions inside of you that said, do I have enough to give into that? And I felt like God said, um, start giving because you don't actually know how much you have. And uh, he said, test me in this, bite off more than you can chew. Because your teeth, your lion's teeth are coming out, and there's a grace on that. Obviously, we still need to rest. Family's important, rest is important. But God is actually going to teach you a pleasure in this where it used to be work in the old season. It won't be work. There'll be pleasure. And God's giving you new strategies and new downloads on how to do that coaching, that counseling, that teaching, that training, and business stuff in a way that's efficient where it's less work on you because you've raised up the next tier, the next generation. And so there's going to be a real wisdom grace that comes on you for how to do that. And uh, it's going to be incredible because you're going to see people that no one else saw as leaders, and you're going to call them into leadership. All right. Is that okay? Bless you in that. You know, sometimes you guys should give me a little bit more on your face. Sometimes I give prophetic words, and they're like, and then afterwards, they're like, oh, my goodness, it was exactly what I, it's going on in my life. Like, that was incredible. Thank you so much. I'm like, thanks for showing that to everyone else. <laughs> criminals, criminals. Okay, okay, thank you. You know, hey, I'm okay being wrong. You know, I've been wrong once. I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm so excited to be with you guys. And I'm really excited because pastor said uh, he preaches to 1.30 every week. Is that true? So once? Well, he's like, maybe more like 1 o'clock. <laughs> can, I, can I get at least like 12.45? Can I get five, 45 minutes of your time? Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I am excited about uh, even, even the word that, uh, what's his name that was on this side? Kevin? Kevin gave, you know, about the fire of the Lord. And uh, I, I had a dream uh, right about this exact time two years ago. In 2022, I had a dream. And in the dream, I am standing there and I've got fiery red hair. I know, super cool, right? 
I, I was pretty impressed with myself. But it was like there was fire on my head. And it was, this, it was standing straight up, super fire. And here comes uh, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And, and God comes to me. And, and he stands in front of me and he begins to roar into me. And when he roars, it's not like the roar of a lion you've seen on the TV where he roars with his mouth. He roared from his being. Everything in him roared at me. And as he roared into me, my insides began to vibrate. And he roared at me, and, and what was crazy is the lion's face changed in the roar. It shifted between Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Lion. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Lion. And, this, and, and it was shifting so fast, it was one, but it was all the different faces at the same time. And it was so intense, and the vibration of the roar was so affecting me that all of a sudden, as it, it, it went into me, it was as if I became one with the roar of the lion, and all I could do was to roar back with all of my being, the same roar that he roared into me. We are being continually transformed. Right? When we're beholding his glory, we're, we're being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from him. It's the glory that comes into us, but the point of it is that we would be transformed by it so we actually look like him to a world that desperately needs it. Now, I was already on fire. And you guys are already on fire for God. You, you, you guys have the fire of the Lord on your community. And I, I walked into the room today, and as I walked into the room and began to worship, there was a level of peace in the room. I'm like, oh, this is special. This is actually special. Um, there, there's a, uh, a, almost like a, um, a covering of peace over the land here. And, and it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a force that emanates from here. It's not a protective force. It's a proactive force that emanates from this place. And what I saw as I, we were worshiping, I saw um, an, it was almost as if uh, the ocean was on the ceiling. And there was water. And as we were worshiping, the water got deeper this way. It was like heaven coming to earth. There was water coming down. Now, it didn't come all the way, but the anticipation was that was God's intent. There's actually an outpouring that is coming, and it's not actually an outpouring. It's a flooding. It's, it, you know, we think of an outpouring like it's raining outside. It's raining really hard. No, this is a drowning, and it's coming. And it's coming. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. We're about to be covered in his glory. We're about to be covered in his glory. And I, I, I just feel it for you guys. I'm excited. Uh, we're just in the foretaste. We're just, you know, you can almost taste it. You're actually just in a scratch and sniff season. You know those scratch and sniff stickers when you're kids? You know, you'd scratch the strawberry and you're like, mmm, and then you taste it and it didn't taste like what it smelled like. I'm like, this sticker does not taste that good. You know, it, it made you hungry. I, I feel like that's what you're tasting right now. It's a scratch and sniff. It's activating your senses where your mouth is watering for the more of the Lord, but you haven't tasted it yet. You haven't. You've only had the scratch and sniff. But more is coming. This is what I'm anticipating. This is what, you know, us at Bethel Church, are, and we're anticipating. We've just been in a scratch and sniff season. What we've, what we've had before was awesome. It's incredible. It's amazing. And I love the encounters of the past. I love all that stuff. But I got to have more. 
And pastor even shared it with Moses, like, you know, Moses, it said, uh, Moses saw God face to face like a friend, right? Face to face all the time. And then the next chapter, it says, Moses is asking God, okay, show me your glory. Wait a second. I thought you saw God face to face. And he says, show me your glory. And then, and then what's uh, God say to Moses? Hey, you can't handle my glory. You can't handle my face. If you saw me, you would die. So I'm going to grab you. I'm going to shove you into a crack in the rock. I'm going to put my hand over you, and I'm going to let you see just the backside of my glory, just part of my glory. Because, and, and I don't know about you, but do you ever read the Bible and get confused by scriptures like that? Wait a second. I thought he saw you face to face. And now you're saying, you can't handle my face. If you saw me, you're going to die. Like, which one is it, God? Which one is it? See, I think Moses saw facets of God's face. But Moses was saying, show me the fullness of your glory. And he's like, no, if I did that, you would explode with my goodness. You would die. You have zero capacity for that. Now, although Moses had more capacity than anyone else in that day and age, He doesn't have the capacity you and I have because of what Jesus purchased on the cross. And we haven't even tasted. Go ahead, take it. I can feel it. He's in the room. We're going to have a, a, a unique Mother's Day message. Because uh, I, I, what I really want to hit on, and I think it partners with what you guys have been going after for the last couple of months. And I know, you know, you guys have a, this big theme of, of love and this big thing of like, hey, we need an outward expression of love to our community. And we need an outpouring of everything that we've got in salvation, in entering into the kingdom. We need to give that away. Matter of fact, I'm going to say this right here because it keeps coming up in my head and I cannot shake it. And this may uh, offend some of you. And pastor just won't ever have me back. Um, that's, that's okay. Uh, but uh, I, I keep, I, God gave me a dream some years ago about Chicago about Chicago, Illinois, and I don't know why I can't shake it on this trip, but I I keep coming back to Chicago and an outpouring of God's presence. I feel like there is a, there's going to be a revival. In this dream, I saw, um, it was like a main street in downtown Chicago, and it was, there was a tidal wave of God's presence and a flood of God's presence that was flowing out of the bars in Chicago. It was literally flowing out of the bars. And I've been praying into Chicago uh, for quite a while and into this prophetic dream that I had. And, uh, and while I was here at the conference, I was, I was reminded of it and I was praying into it. And, uh, and I, I had this weird idea. Um, and I believe it was the voice of God. He said, um, I believe, I, I feel like he said this, I'm going to have people start bars in Chicago called Liquid Courage. And, uh, you know, the, the, the joke, you know, uh, you know, adult beverages cause liquid courage. You, you, you drink enough of those and there's no more... Uh, boundaries or inhibitions, no more fears. It's like you lose your fears. Now, I know we're in church. Stick with me. But I felt like they were actually uh, uh, sneak attacks from the church. They, the church said, no, we're actually going to start a bar called Liquid Courage. And what we're going to do is as we serve alcohol, we'll serve prophetic words and we'll bring true courage and and they would people would begin to recognize the difference and then there would be teams in the bars and bartenders who actually brought
the glory of the Lord in the presence of the Spirit. And people would get drunk in the Holy Spirit. And it'd actually be a movement that flows out of the bars. I don't know about you, but there was a guy named Daniel in, in the Bible. You remember this guy? He was a magician. Um, that's what they called him, right? Uh, um, a magician, uh, uh, the, 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 all of these wise men, the magicians, the, the, the Gandalfs of the day, you know? And, 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 and Daniel was great being called a certain thing, but he was pure here. He didn't care about the title. And I have a feeling that God might offend us and he might call us to spaces and places. And maybe it's just because some of you have had some ideas of doing some things in business or entrepreneurship that you're like, oh, wait, the church doesn't do that. And God's like, no, I'm calling you into that space to actually affect that environment, but you're going to bring my glory into those spaces. And I believe God is raising up a Daniel generation, and, and he's going to give you creative ideas, and, and, and it might be some of you in the room. It might be crazy. It might be crazy, but it just might be the spot. We've got a guy on our staff, um, and this is, uh, you're like, oh, this could start rumors. Uh, Bethel's already got a lot of rumors. <laughs> uh, um, but this guy loves to play, play poker. And, uh, and he's been in the World Series of Poker, you know, like the TV poker guys, you know, professional poker players. And he's, they call him Jesus. He's got, he's got his, everyone has their special nickname and handle. They call him Jesus because he's long hair and he doesn't drink. And he, he shares Jesus with people at the poker tables. And one of the worst guys on the poker circuit who um, actually was in uh, the business of pharmaceuticals. <laughs> illegal ones. All up and down the state of California. Um, and this was the last person our guy thought would ever get saved and one day, just a couple of months ago, our guy is walking through the Bethel bookstore, and the guy is in there. And he's got a, a unique uh, nickname, and it starts with a cuss word, and we're in church, so we won't, we won't share that. But, uh, and, 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 and our guy goes up to him and says, what are you doing here? And he's like, Jesus, what are you doing here? Because that's the guy's nickname, you know. What are you doing here? And, and he's like, I work here. I, you know, this is where I go to church. And he's like, oh, I got saved. I got saved. And he stopped. He, he stopped doing the, the drug stuff. And now he's, he's, he's changing everything in life. He's actually going to be coming to our school of ministry this year. Why? Because someone decided to do something that the church says, oh, you shouldn't be in there. You shouldn't do that. And, and they decided to bring Jesus to a place no one was bringing Jesus to. And look at the effects. I'm just saying, you guys are in the right spot at the right time. Pastor even said it like, hey, the darker it gets, the brighter your light shines. And meanwhile, most of the church is trying to stay in the light. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> My wife, she's like, she went to a rotary meeting this other, uh, the other day, and, and she's like, Ben, I'm, I'm going to sign up for rotary. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, it's awesome. You get to do stuff in the community, and I get to hang out with people who don't know God. It's amazing. I love hanging out with them because my wife is a secret evangelist. She is like the most loving relational evangelist you can imagine. And she starts winning people that seem impossible. Actually, we're godparents uh, to a, a, a little boy. Um, and uh, the mother is a makeup artist that Heather met um, doing weddings and so impacted, the father is a tattoo artist and a, a, a devout atheist. I love atheists. 
Because they're just super honest on where they're at. And like, yeah, I don't believe anything, any of it. And like, I, I get, but he, this is what they said. We want you to be uh, our, our child's godparents because number one, you hunt. Praise God. Um, you know, number one, you hunt. And he's like, I don't hunt and I need my, my boy to be a man. Amen. Amen. And then not just that, he's like, they're like, uh, he, he says, I don't have religion. I need him to have some religion. And I'm like, what he's saying is not religion. He's saying, I want him to have what you have. And, and, and it's amazing how we can actually impact our community if you'd get into your community. If you wouldn't treat it as an us or them, like, hey, we're winning, you're losing, you know, or, or whatever the battle is. It's a, we all win. God is after them. You know, the worst ones, the worst ones. And one of the best ways to bring Jesus to a community is through the prophetic, is through the gift of prophecy that we see in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3. But the one who prophesies, that's you and I, that's all of us. The one who prophesies, prophesies for the strengthening, the encouragement, and the comfort of another. Now, let me just tell you, those are three currencies that if you don't have, you cannot apprehend your future. If you don't have strength, courage, and comfort, it, it, it is impossible for you to apprehend your future. And let me just tell you, those who are believers in Christ Jesus, who've been transformed by his presence and have access to him, it has actually his nature. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. So strength, courage, and comfort are all commodities, currencies that we get from a relationship, an abiding relationship with the Holy Spirit. And it's so vital and it's so important that people get courage. I don't know about you, but has there ever been a situation in your life where you face something and you're like, I, I can't do this. I am too afraid. This is too hard. I can't do it. And someone came and they gave you some courage. It's called encouragement. They put courage inside of you and they took something that you didn't have and they took from their self and their courage and their belief in you and they gave you courage. And then you were able to do something you couldn't do. There are some days you're laying in bed and you're like, if I don't get some strength, I cannot face my day. There's no way I can face my day. I don't, no way I can face this stuff. I am wrecked. I'm ruined. And someone says, come on, you can do this. Usually it was your mother. Come on, you can do this. I believe in you. This is what they bring on a regular basis. What else do, do mothers bring in spades? Comfort. Comfort. And here's one. This is one of the most important things in this season um, because I believe people know the Holy Spirit in name only. They know his, him as the comforter in name only. How do I know that? Because even in the church, we're addicted to artificial comfort. We avoid pain and we don't know how to be in pain with people. We try and remove pain from them rather than comfort them in their pain. And what happens then is we ignore pain and we take pain and the hooks of trauma into revival in the future and it pollutes the move of God. Some of us, we actually need to get through the season, that COVID season, that fear season, that pain season, that loss season, the hooks of trauma season, where we got addicted to other comforts, other things, we got addicted to artificial comfort. What does that look like? You know, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's overeating. Maybe that's overworking because I, I, I don't want to feel the pain of this. So I'll just uh, consume my mind with more work so I don't have to look at the pain. Maybe it's scrolling. 
Maybe it's binge watching Netflix. I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it's drugs or alcohol. Maybe it's getting addicted to even prescription drugs because it numbs the pain. And if we ignore pain long enough, it will actually do something to our physical body. If we ignore spiritual and emotional pain, it will actually ruin your physical body and you'll need drugs to recalibrate. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm saying, oh, we ignored the comforter for too long and now you're gonna actually need help because you messed up your physical body. This is a season where we definitely need comfort. And God, in his grace and love for us, sometimes doesn't take us out of the pain. He just wants to be in it with you. Why? He knows what it is to suffer. He knows what it is to be in there, and he knows the result of suffering and what it can produce in our life. And he's like, no, we're going to go through this. And I will be with you. Throughout the Old Testament, what made the difference between all of the people that we see as heroes of the faith was this. I'm with you. I'm with you. God God talks to Gideon in Judges chapter 6. And, and uh, I love this story. But he, 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 angel of the Lord shows up. Gideon's hiding, you know, in a wine press, threshing wheat. He's doing the right thing in the wrong place. He's afraid. And, and the angel of the Lord shows up and says, God is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon looks around like, Are you talking to me? It's like, you're the only one here. You're the only one in the wine press. Okay, well, uh, and Gideon begins to tell God all of the excuses why he's not a mighty warrior. See, the statement wasn't, you're a mighty warrior, therefore God is with you. No, the statement was, God is with you, therefore you are a mighty warrior. And what the problem is, is many of us, we're going through problems and facing things in life, not realizing who's standing right next to us. Not realizing who is with us. God is with you, therefore, there is no issue, there is no problem, there is no pain that you cannot overcome. There is no fight because I'm, I'm going to fight it for you. And, 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 and it's funny because Gideon makes all these excuses and then the Lord says this to him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go in your strength and deliver the Israelites out of the hands of the Midianites. Wait a second, God, time out. I just said I have no strength. He's like, yeah, I can use that. Because I'm going to be with you. I don't care if you're negative 53 in faith. I don't care if you feel like your bank account is, is in the red all the time. It doesn't matter if, you know, you're, you're, you're too strong, you're too weak, you're too tall, you're too short, you have too much hair, or you don't have enough. It's a fashion statement, right? We look good. The point is, stop looking at you. Start realizing who's next to you. This is the power of the prophetic. There is nothing more dignifying than to be known by God. Nothing more dignifying. You remember in the book of John, the calling of uh, these two guys, uh, Philip and Nathaniel. You remember this story? I, I love this story. I'll tell it to you, the BIV version, the Ben's International Version. I'll paraphrase it. You can look it up. Uh, John chapter 1. Uh, and, and John, uh, it, it, he... 
tells about this story, and, and Philip has now found the Christ. And, and uh, what's crazy is Jesus Christ is there and comes to Philip, and, and Jesus says something crazy to him. Hey, come and follow me. And Philip does. Now, I don't know if you've actually thought about that, but how about this? Some crazy Yahoo guy on the street comes up to you. Hey, follow me. Are you going to follow that person? Let, this is not a trick question. Are you going to follow someone I just, you just mean? I'm like, my question is, what was on Jesus' voice? What was in his nature that he could just say, follow me, and someone would follow? Obviously, there's a community there. There's something going on. But man, I'm like, what was on Jesus' voice? And then, G you know, uh, Philip is so pumped. He goes to Nathaniel and says, hey, Nate, I found the Christ. Uh, I'm super pumped. I found the one that they wrote about in the book of the law. And, and I found the Messiah. And, and Nathaniel's like, are you serious? I've been waiting for this. We've been praying for this. High five. This is amazing. Where's he from? It's Jesus of Nazareth. Whoa, 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 whoa. Time out. Nazareth? Are you serious? Can anything good come out of that place? And I love Philip because he was probably just like, hey, shh, shh, shh. Just, just, just come and see. Just cut, shut it. Stop talking. Stop talking yourself out of this. You know, it's kind of like uh, me. I'm, I'm from a little small town called Weaverville, California. I, I moved back there when I was four years old. I say moved back because my dad was raised in Weaverville. Four months later, this guy named Bill Johnson came and took over the Little Assemblies of God church there in Weaverville. Can anything good come out of Weaverville? I'm like, yeah, yeah, it can. And, and what Jesus does is that, you know, Philip takes Nathaniel to see Jesus, and it says when Nathaniel is a far way off, Jesus says, here's a true Israelite. In him, there's nothing false. Now, he, we, we read it that way. We read it that way of like, oh, wow, that's a great word. No, Jesus yelled it. Because if, if Nathaniel's a far way off and he heard it, then it had to be uh, a little bit extra volume. Hey, here's a true Israelite. In him, there's nothing false. It's a declaration over him and his identity, and it's a declaration to a community of who he really is and creating a value system in this person. And what is Nathaniel's response? How do you know me? The prophetic is so dignifying because it, it deep down in sight of every single one of us, believer, non-believer, is a desire to be known by our Heavenly Father, to be valued by Him, to be called out in our truest identity. The problem is we've had a lot of people running around telling people just what's on the surface. We've had mothers and fathers doing that. And no one actually sees them. This is what's so important out of 1 Timothy 1.18. I love Paul talking to Timothy. Remember, Paul was a murderer of Christians. And now he's talking to Timothy. And listen to this language. Timothy, my son. Timothy, my son. I give you instructions in keeping with the prophetic words once made over your life so that with them you'd fight the good fight of faith and have a clean conscience. I love that heart because you actually see a father's heart. And this morning, I'm just getting going. <laughs> this morning, I want to talk to you about the father and mother heart of, of the prophetic. And I throw in mothers there because this heart is the heart of the father actually doesn't just represent us men as a father. It's actually the paternal heart. It is that parental heart that sees people in a healthy way. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
verses 11 and 12. And, and if you guys like extra credit homework, um, you can read all of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 because I, I love this portion of Scripture because the way that Paul is communicating to the church is through the imagery of family. And family is the kingdom structure. It really is. He said, didn't we come to you as a, 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 a little children? You know, nursing children. Didn't we come to you in a, hum, a place of humility, in a place of uh, need? And didn't we come to that you like that? Didn't we come to you like um, uh, mothers? Didn't we come to you in verse 11 and 12? For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and his glory. Listen to that language. It's the same language Paul uses here for fathers that he uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3, which is our foundations in the prophetic, right? The one who prophesies, prophesies for the strengthening, the encouragement, and the comfort of another. It's actually urging you to live a life worthy of God. So I, I believe, Ben Armstrong believes that the prophetic and fathering and mothering should have never been separated. See, because a father and mother, they're more interested in, in their children discovering their healthy identity than just giving a good word or competing with their words. There's no competition there. There's a desire for our children to reach their full potential. Timothy, my son, I give you instructions in keeping with the prophetic words. What does that mean? Not only are the prophetic words weapons that have a cause faith in our life and a clean conscience, it's the instructions of healthy mothers and fathers connected with our prophetic destiny that help do that. Just recently, I was um, having a meeting with uh, Chris Valentin and, and Dan Fairley and, and, uh, and a few others and and we were going through our schedules and stuff, and my wife and I, and we we're potentially going to take on a, a new uh, pastoral role uh, in, in, in one of our services. And, uh, and, and as they began to look at it, and they began to look at our schedule, um, all, all of a sudden they began to realize, wait a second, we commissioned you as the senior prophet of our house to apostolically reproduce around the world, and now we're trying to keep you home. This isn't in line with the prophetic words spoken over your life, so we need to actually make sure we're not putting you in a cage when we should be launching you out. See, that's the beauty of fathers and mothers in your life who know your prophetic destiny, and they don't try and tell you what to do. They try and inspire you into that prophetic destiny. And then what happens when I listen to the instructions and my prophetic words, I have faith. What's faith? It's a commodity that helps usher me into the future, and, and it helps me fight. It's a weapon to fight for my future. I believe in my future, and not only that, it gives me a clean conscience. Now, now, I grew up in the church, and when I heard this scripture, clean conscience, I was like, oh, you mean I didn't think about sin that day? That's what I think of as a clean conscience many times. I don't know about you, but I've always thought, if I have a clean conscience, I did have one bad thought today, clean conscience. That has nothing to do with this scripture. This scripture has everything to do with, do you think about yourself the way God thinks about you? That's a clean conscience. Do you have a right identity image? And that's what the prophetic brings to you. It is so powerful. And now Jesus calls out Nathaniel. Here's a true Israelite. In him there's nothing false. How do you know me? And then, and then Jesus says, I saw you while you're still under the fig tree. Let's just look at this just for a moment because a fig tree, a wild fig tree, if you've ever seen one, the way it grows is it 
if it's in leaf, it grows all the way to the ground. And if someone was sitting under the tree, you couldn't see him. It'd be impossible to see him the way that those trees grow. And it said, and Jesus says, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree. Why was Nathaniel so impressed? Because either Jesus had a vision of it or, or, or you know, God came and, and gave him a picture in his mind. I don't know, but it, it would have been impossible. That's why he was so impressed. And I, I think about it, I love the law of first mention in scripture, and I think about the first time we saw a fig tree in the Bible, or a fig leaf in the Bible, right? Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they tried to hide their nakedness from God, their shame, their guilt, all the stuff they were hiding. What if Nathaniel was in hiding? What if Nathaniel was amongst a bunch of people, but he's hiding under the tree and he feels like no one sees him? I don't know about you, but sometimes in church, you can be amongst a lot of people, but never feel like you're seen. You know what the prophetic does? It says, I see you. When no one else sees you, I see you. And in your hiding... I will find you. This is the power of the prophetic. This is the power of having a mother and father heart pursuing people who desperately need to know they were made in the image of God. More now than ever. Genesis chapter 20, verse 7 We've got this, uh, this story, and I'll give you a little bit of a, a background here. This is Abraham, and uh, Abraham is, is coming up to a, a, a new place, and there's this king, King Abimelech, and, and uh, he's got a hot wife named Sarah. And, uh, and, and he's like, oh no, the king's going to kill me if he thinks this is my wife. I'll just tell him it's my sister. Hey, this is my sister. And you know what? Abraham and Sarah are pretty old at this time. Ladies, do you want to know the spa treatment that she had? Like, what was her skincare regimen that made her so beautiful that Abraham's thinking, the king's going to kill me because my wife is so beautiful, even though she's that old? You want to sign up for that one? It's Mother's Day. Come on. It's spa. You need the spa. Um, and, and this is that moment. And so uh, what's crazy is God shows up in, 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 in Genesis uh, chapter 20, verse 7. He shows up to the, the wicked king. This is a bad king, right? And he shows up to the king and he says, hey, uh, you know that lady that Abraham said was his sister? It's not his sister. It's his wife. And he's like, whoa, 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 time out, God. Uh, I, I didn't know he lied to me. And God said, yeah, that's all right. Um, that's why I didn't allow you to touch her because if you did, I was going to kill you. Oh, my God. God. And, then he, and then God doubles down and says this, go to Abraham because he's my prophet and he will pray for you so this doesn't happen to you. But if you touch her, I'm going to kill you and all your people. That's kind of intense. And you notice how God never even dealt with Abraham lying? I'm like, God, I would not do what? What's going on here? I don't know, but what stands out to me and the point I want to make here is God calls Abraham his prophet. It's one of the very first times in the Bible he actually calls someone his prophet. How do we know Abraham? We know of him as the father of Father of faith, the father of many, the father of nations, right? We know him as a father, and maybe, just maybe, fathering and mothering never should have been separated from the prophetic. The hearts of fathers and mothers are so immensely invested in sons and daughters and their success. They're, 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 they're so concerned about their success, they're less worried about giving people a wow word. We no longer want to just give our children a word that puffs them up. I, I, I don't like giving soul-based words. 
Just what, oh, what I think people would like to hear. Tickling their ears with something that has no origin in God. I think it's 1 Peter where it says, uh, no prophecy had its origins in the will of man, but people were led by the Spirit. And I want to be led by the Spirit when I'm speaking over them. And that's why uh, 1 Timothy 1.18 is so important because I need to value not only the prophetic words, but I need good mothers and fathers in my life. How many of you have a mother or father in your life who can um, uh, maybe potentially slap you upside the head and say, hey, that's not in line with your prophetic destiny, and you'll say, thank you. Some of us do, but how many of you have ever had someone in your life, a, a pastor, a leader, a coach, a teacher, instructor, uh, someone like that who, who doesn't care about your future, and then they try and tell you what to do? Yeah, yeah, we've all had that. And how many of us wanted to do what they told us to do? None of us wanted to. Some of us did just because we, you know, the person had a badge or something like that. Police officer, pull over. Okay, yes, sir. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, but really, I want to be moved by people who actually care about my future, who care about my destiny. And this is what happens when we develop a prophetic culture in our church. It creates a belief system in people that says it's impossible for you not to apprehend your future. Because we're going to hold you to the prophetic standard of what God has spoken over your life. And we're going to make ways, we're going to make space for that identity to happen in our community. It's so powerful. And when we get good at it here, it translates out there really well. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 15, even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ Jesus, you have very few fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. You know, I grew up in Weaverville, a little small mountain town, and we had... Um, we were growing in the prophetic and learning, and we had one guy in our church who was super prophetic, super gifted, but he was a horrible father at the time. He was really uh, not very good at, he was, he was practicing, he was, he, was, he was learning, we're all learning, right? We've all made mistakes, but the problem was what he would do was uh, what he should be doing as a father, he tried to do as a prophet, and he would call his children out in the, in, the, uh, in the sanctuary and then tell them what to do and call it prophecy. No, that's not prophecy. That, that's, that's just unhealthy. Prophecy is not about telling you what to do. It's about inspiring you into who you are. And the problem was he was operating outside of a healthy identity and we prophesy from a strong identity, not for one. And we can get, we, we know when we're prophesying for identity is when we're always trying to perform. If we're always trying to earn love. See, a lot of us still believe like, oh, uh, you know, Joe over here, Joe Awesome just gave a prophetic word. And, and Susie Stupendous over here, she's trying to one up the prophetic word because we know that God is exactly like every person in the world, right? No. We, we, we've learned that actually um, the better we do, the more praise we get, the more love we get. And, and we, we, we've learned in, in life that maybe our, our mom or our dad or, or someone in life, you know, they gave extra praise the better I did with my performance. And then if I had brothers and sisters, there's only so much love to go around. And then I have to perform for love. Listen, God is not impressed with your gift. He gave it to you. He doesn't want to talk to your gift. He wants to talk to you. He's impressed with you. And when we get that anchored really well, then no longer do we show up and try to compete with one another. 
Though you have 10,000 guardians, what are guardians? Babysitters. They're concerned about behavior, not identity. You have a bunch of police in the church policing your behavior but never calling out your identity. The world doesn't need their behavior called out. Yeah, but what about the Samaritan woman at the well? Well, first of all, that wasn't a public setting. It was Jesus and the woman, and they were alone. Number two, Jesus rocks up, and he actually creates value right away. He's leaning on the well. The woman comes, and he says, will you give me a drink? And what's her response? How can you ask me for a drink? It wasn't a negative thing. It was a positive thing that she's like, "Uh, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. Don't you know we're racist? Like, don't you know we have problems here? You're a man. I'm a woman. You're talking to me in in a private place. Like, what, what? We don't do this. And Jesus is asking for a, for a drink. And, and, and some of you are like, well, how's that showing value? Actually, in that day and age, receiving someone's hospitality actually said you were humble enough that this person has a value that they can give to you. In racism, you have nothing that can give to me that could make me better. Jesus says, you have something. Could you, could you give me a drink of water? And the, lady, the lady's impressed with this whole situation already impacted. Jesus, when he shows up, he, he, he messes up any worldly system that is wrong. And he challenges it right away and he brings the kingdom and he brings a right standing. What's he do? Um, hey, you know what? If you knew who was asking you for water, water, you'd ask him for living water. And she's like, living water? Yeah, living water. She's like, sir, where, where, do, you, where, do, you, where do you get this? Living? And you know what? If you drank this living water, you'd never be thirsty again. The lady's like, I have to come to this well all the time, five times a day. That would be amazing. I need some living water. Give it to me. Where are you going to get it? Like the well's really deep. You don't even have a, a bucket. Are you greater than our father Jacob who dug this well? Matter of fact, he was. He was. And then Jesus says something crazy in that moment. He says, "Um, hey, why don't you go get your husband, bring him back, and I'll give you this living water. Sir, I, I have no husband. And he's like, yeah, that's correct. You've had five, and the man you're with right now isn't even your husband. She's blown away. She's blown away not because Jesus called out sin, Because Jesus knows everything about her and is giving her value anyway. Will you give me a drink of water? I want to give you a drink. I want to give you living water. Wait a second. You know my sin and you still love me? How many of you ever got saved later on in life, but somewhere in life someone said to you, Jesus loves you, and your first thought was this, yeah, but if Jesus loved me, or, or if he knew about my life, he wouldn't love me. If he knew what I did in life, and Jesus say, I know everything about you, and I love you. And she's so impressed, she's not in shame, she's in excitement. She runs to her community, tells them, and, and it says, they believe not just because of uh, her testimony, but because they experienced Jesus Christ for themselves. What was Jesus doing? He wasn't exposing sin. He was exposing need. He was saying this, sweetheart, you've been going to the well of men your whole life. And it's never satisfied you. You tried in the godly construct of marriage to satisfy that void within within you. And it was never satisfied. So you tried a new husband. Maybe I'm with the wrong husband. And I'll go get another husband. And then you were still hungry. You're still thirsty. You went, so you're like, oh, maybe I'm with the wrong husband. Five different times you tried that. And then you thought, oh, maybe the problem is marriage. So maybe I'll just cohabitate with someone. And he says, you're still thirsty. The love you're looking for is only found in me. 
And that is what satisfies. And we live in a day and age right now where the world is doubling down and tripling down and going even further than just cohabitating. Now they're saying, uh, maybe I'm with the wrong sex. Maybe I'm with the wrong sex and that'll satisfy. And then that doesn't satisfy. Oh, maybe I'm the wrong sex. Maybe that'll satisfy. Oh, maybe I'm both sexes. Oh, maybe that'll satisfy. Do you see the never-ending cycle? The answer is only met in Jesus Christ. And when we prophesy, we introduce people to the answer. We introduce people to that relationship. We're not trying to change their behavior. We're trying to meet their need that changes their behavior. See, the problem is, there's a lot of people who don't know who they are. They just know how bad they are. And they're reminded all the time of how bad they are, all the mistakes in their life. They don't need to know all the mistakes. They need to know who they really are in their identity. Here's a true Israelite. In him, there's nothing false. We need to call that out. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. See, in the last days, I will send to you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, and he will restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. See, the prophetic ministry actually restores family relationships. And, and it goes on to say, so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. Here's what happens when healthy family is restored. The land is blessed. I'll tell you what. Climate change, all of the stuff that's going on with the planet in negative, I think the number one healthy thing we can do for climate change isn't about carbon emissions. It's about healthy families. All, all creation longs for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. Why? Creation was subjected to a curse through mankind and still is until the redemption of the sons and daughters of God begin to reveal themselves. The redemption of the family, the kingdom of Christ and healthy there and then our land is going to be healed. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. The healing of the land is coming, but it starts with the restoration of healthy family. And healthy family is established through the spirit of prophecy. Are you with me? Are you bored on Mother's Day? I, I, this, is, this is so important, but... What I, I want to anchor ourselves with that father and mother heart, but that father and mother heart actually displays love. Right, Tracy? Right? Okay, say it louder. Yeah, love. I love it. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14, and you can even throw in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to uh, hit on this really quickly, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, but I, I, I could spend like the whole day with you guys. There's so much I want to train and equip you in. And I would want to activate you in prophecy and do all that stuff. We'll do it another time. If I didn't offend Pastor bad enough. Uh, uh, Christy wants me back, but uh, you know, uh, <laughs> we'll see. Um, First Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 11 12, 13, and 14. I love this because uh, this is a, a church plant. This is amazing. This is new church happening. Um, and and they're, they're rocking re revival. They're rocking the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're doing all this stuff. But they're doing all the stuff disconnected from the Holy Spirit. They're actually disconnected from communion with God and communion with one another. That's 1 Corinthians 11. So Paul rocks up to the church of Corinth. Think of uh, 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 Las Vegas on steroids. So that was Corinth. That was, that was pretty much what it was. It was crazy town. It was all about the carnal, all about me. It was all about self 
And it was all about one-upping everyone else in carnality. And so now what was supposed to be communion, sharing the communion meal, see, it wasn't just bread and wine back then. It was a full meal that they would experience together. And in the experience of community this way and community this way, we'd have a healthy kingdom expression. There's a remembrance of what Jesus Christ has purchased for us as the body of Christ, as the bride, and there's unity that is happening. There is communion, and they are messed up. They are jacked up, and, and Paul's like, first of all, let's get communion right because you make it all about you, and you get there first, and you eat all the food, and you get drunk on the wine, and you leave nothing for everyone else, and there's no community happening. I love the sign out front that says real community. Real community as it isn't just Sunday morning. Real community happens around meals, around the dinner table. You know, we have family dinner night uh, every week that we're in town. And even if I'm not in town, like we still do family dinner night and we include the fiancés as well. And what do we have? We do real life together. We do uh, dinner and then we do high, low, high. You know, hey, what's the high of your week? What's the low of your week? And what's another high of your week? You know, we're gonna actually celebrate God's goodness and the testimony of what he's doing in your life. We wanna know you and then tell me also pain points so we can be with you in your pain. So we can be with you in the emotions that we're facing in life. And we're real with one another and it creates connection. It creates communion. My wife and I wake up in the morning and we've got a jar, a candy jar at our house. We don't eat candy every morning, no. It's actually filled with the little communion cups. And we, we take that and we, we have our coffee and we take communion with each other. And you know what it does? It not only connects us with our, our heavenly father and, and uh, our, our bridegroom, it actually connects us uh, with the spirit of God and the spirit of one another. We actually are more connected the days we do communion with one another. And God wants that right. So it, Paul's like adjust, making adjustments with these guys. And then he's like, hey, guys, you're rocking gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he, he names a bunch of gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I don't think he was trying to be exhaustive. And one of those gifts is prophecy in there. Uh, you know, some gifts like the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, the gift of healing, the gift of prophecy, the gift of the discerning of spirits, you know, the gift of uh, tongues and interpretation, the gift of miracles or miraculous power, all these different gifts. I don't think Paul was trying to be exhaustive. I don't think he was saying, these are the only gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is only what's legal in the church. No, he's just saying, hey, these are some of the common ones you do. But the problem is you're operating in those and your theology is whacked. He's like, your theology is messed up, guys. You're, 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 you're bringing all of that, that polytheism that, that you grew up in where there was many gods. You know, there's the, the God of thunder, there's the God of chaos. There's the God of this. There's the God of that. And, and you're saying there's a God of prophecy. And then there's a separate God of healing. And then there's a separate God uh, of the word of knowledge. And he's like, no, 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 time out, guys. It, 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 there's many gifts, but it comes from one spirit, the Holy Spirit. These are gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I love Paul because even in the mess of the church of Corinth in, in, in their, their, their wrong way of thinking, in their selfish way of thinking, in non-relational, non-family way of thinking, even in their performance, competing with their gifts and trying to fight with the gifts and thinking was all these different gods. Paul didn't take them out of the game. He didn't say, okay, time out. No one can do the stuff. You got a bad heart. No, he makes adjustments on the fly. Keep doing the stuff, but your heart's messed up. And then he goes into, you know, the follow the way of love. I love it because he's like, hey, first of all, 
if you really did have communion and you really did understand this was one spirit, you'd connect with that spirit. And when you connect with that spirit, you'd actually follow his way. And one of the fruits of the spirits, the primary fruits of the spirit is love. I need some love happening, not competition. In Galatians, he says, after he talks about the fruits of the Holy Spirit, and he's ticked with the Galatians. He's like, why don't you just go ahead and cut everything off instead of just being circumcised? And I'm like, that's intense. Like, that's intense language. Like, if we said that in church nowadays, like, we'd be kicked out. But Paul's like, intense. He's, he's upset with them, and, and he's like, you know, these are the fruits of the Spirit. Why do you keep provoking each other to envy? Why? Because we're competing with our gifts. We don't know that our God is infinite. Guess what? If God gave me everything I could potentially handle in love, and then he times it by a million and shoved it into me, it could still never take away from What's your name, sweetheart? Allie? Allie. Ellie? Ellie. Okay, Ellie. It could never take away from the amount of love God has left over for Ellie. Why? Take any number from infinity. What do you have left over? You have infinity left over. You cannot subtract from God. So why are we competing? Why are you stuck in performance? God is infinite. There's more than enough to go around. And, 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 and can I just say this? They're called gifts of the Holy Spirit, not responsibilities of the Holy Spirit. And I see a lot of the church doing the responsibilities of the Holy Spirit. They're good robots for God. I have to do this. I'm like, no, you get to. It's a pleasure. If you lost the pleasure in the gift... Take a break. Get your heart posture, your communion connected right and feel the pleasure of the Lord and the originator of the gift. Get reconnected to the Spirit of God. And then it goes into this love chapter. And I love the love chapter and I shared a little of this at the conference, but what's so funny about that is my daughters are about to get married, right? And, and, uh, you know, we've got a wedding coming up. I don't think I'll quote 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 and following. But that is like the wedding scripture. I, I, I don't know how many weddings you've been to. I've, I've been to a lot of them. I've performed a lot of wedding ceremonies. And there's always, you know, Aunt Susie or, or, or uh, Uncle Bob or the niece or nephew or someone or the minister. Someone. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Doesn't boast. Love is not rude. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. Keeps no records of wrongs. Doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. Oh, that's so beautiful. Awesome, right? And it works in the context of marriage. It was just never written in the context of marriage. It was actually written in the context of the administration of spiritual gifts. What's God saying? Your gifts look like something, and if it doesn't look like love, then it isn't actually representing the Spirit of God, the giver of the gift. And there's a lot of people who are operating in the gift. They're just not representing the giver of the gift. How do you know that, Ben? Well, Scripture says... In, in those days, you'll come to me and say, didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I do all this incredible stuff? And God's like, yeah, but I never knew you. The gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. Have you ever heard that one? Uh, if you don't use your gift, you'll lose your gift. Yeah, it's not biblical. That's not actually biblical. Now, you may lose some proficiency in your gift because practice, continual use equals proficiency, but gifts and callings of God are, are irrevocable. They're without repentance. He doesn't remove them because you're not living for him anymore. Or you're disconnected from the Holy Spirit. And if you are disconnected, just repent. Do it real fast and keep doing the stuff. Like get reconnected. 
How do I, you know, sometimes people ask, how do I know if I'm, if I'm connected with the Holy Spirit when I'm operating in the gift? Well, take any one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that you're operating in and substitute the word love and put in the gift, and now you know what it looks like. So it sounds like this. We're talking about prophecy this morning. So the, here it is. The prophetic is patient. I had to learn this as a, a young prophet because I'm so uh, future driven and I wanted to just get people to their future. And I'm like, I, I just want to get people the leapfrog from where they're at into their future. The problem is that that jumps them outside of process and process is the journey that God uses to establish a root system to sustain that which he wants to build in someone. And if I get so excited as a prophet as a prophet, and I just try and tell you your future way out here, and I take you out of your process, I'll actually cause more pain and more harm and potentially a longer journey for you to apprehend that. This is why God many times will breadcrumb us towards our future. I had to fall in love with people's process. Praise God, I got hired first as a revival group pastor in our school of ministry. Because in our school of ministry, what happened was I began to learn something that God loves process. Because I would take my students into my office and I'd tell them their problem and I'd tell them their future and they're like, oh my goodness, you know everything about me. This is amazing. You know my future. It's incredible. And then when opposition came to their future because I'm the one that initiated it, they're like, oh, you're wrong. Oh, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because they didn't choose it for themselves. I had to learn to ask good questions. Maybe they were leading because I can see their future. But then I'd ask questions, and then I'd say, and then once they find a, a, a unique solution of what they are supposed to do in the future or next thing they're supposed to do, instead of telling them, and sometimes they're like, I don't know what I should do next. I'm like, what would you like? Some suggestions. They're like, yeah, I'd love some. And I still wouldn't give them an answer. I'd say, what would happen if you did this? Well, maybe X, Y, and Z. And what would happen if you did this after that? Well, this, this, and this. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Brilliant. That's amazing. I think that's a great idea. Right? Like it's their idea. I breadcrumb them along to discover that for themselves. Now they have ownership. A lot of us in the body of Christ are waiting for God to tell us what to do so we don't have to take ownership. Sorry, I said that out loud, didn't I? Sometimes we're like, I want the pressure on God. Well, it didn't happen, so it's God's fault. Well, God told me to do it. And a lot of us in this season, God's like, hey, what are you going to do based on your relationship with me? Wait, wait, God, just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. Just tell, take, take the pressure off me. No. God believes in you. What's unique is uh, written on his thighs in the book of Revelation is king of kings and lord of lords. Not king of weaklings, lord of losers. King of kings, lord of lords. Do you know kings and lords make decisions? If God's quiet and your heart's after him, he wants you to make a choice. Why? Because he's establishing your kingship. He, he, he thinks you're brilliant. Love is patient. The prophetic is patient. The prophetic is kind. The prophetic isn't jealous doesn't boast, it's not proud, it's not rude, it doesn't dishonor other people. The prophetic isn't easily angered. You know, in the, in the past, we've had angry prophets. I'm sorry, will you forgive us? Will you forgive us? Because I think sometimes in the body of Christ, um, we ha haven't always represented God well and his nature well.
We're learning. We're getting better. The prophetic isn't easily angered. The prophetic keeps no records of wrong. Let me just say this one thing about um, the, the prophetic uh, isn't easily angered. It is so vitally important. Years ago, I was prophesying over man, um, and, uh, and the day before, I kept getting this old sitcom song in my head, and it was, um, it was to this uh, TV show called uh, My Three Sons. And uh, I kept getting this ringing over my head, and I'm like, I feel like this is a word for this man, but I know he only has two sons. He has three business partners, but what is this? My three sons. And so I went to him and said, wait, what is this my three son, sons thing? I, I know you have two sons, but was there ever anything about another son? And he said, actually, yeah, w both my wife and I felt like we were supposed to have a third son. We actually ha had a name and everything. But one day, and this is a, a billionaire, a, a businessman, business investment banker, and I'm sitting with him. And he said, but I one day... I got introduced to a guy, and they said he was a prophet. I, at the time, I didn't know what prophets were. I didn't know anything. And I sat across the dinner table from him, and he stopped at one point. He slammed his hands on the table, and he pointed at me and my wife, and he said, God said you better have a baby. You're, you're supposed to have a son, and you better have a baby. And the way that he said it, he said it actually aborted our ability to have our son we knew it was right word, but the delivery actually stole that from us. And so I had to repent for what we did as, as prophets to this man. And, uh, and we want to be careful with our delivery. If it's not displaying love, it can actually do more damage than good. Even though it's a right word, when you're in a wrong spirit, it actually can steal away from the seed. Yeah. It keeps no records of wrongs. The prophetic doesn't delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. See, we're not about calling out people's sins. We're actually calling out people's identity. It is not supernatural for you. If I tell all of you right now, go run outside, get me two handfuls of dirt. All of you could do that within about 10 minutes. You'd all be back here. If I said, go get me two handfuls of diamonds little different story there. You're not looking for dirt. Yeah, but what if I see it? Keep digging. Keep looking. Yeah, but what about, I'm like, shut it. That is not the commodity we're mining. We're getting rid of dirt. We're, we're removing the dirt so we can find the diamonds inside of people. If you keep seeing dirt in someone, keep digging. Keep digging. If you see, keep seeing dirt in your community, keep digging. You need to know, you guys, the prophetic is a metal detector that says there's something deeper in here. There's something better. There's something valuable in here. There's something valuable in our community. And when we get eyes to see that, we get out there and we no longer see the negatives. We begin to see what God says over the region, over our space, over our people, over our community, over our family, over our business over our children it is so important and when we get this heart it actually displays the love of God that creates an irresistible attraction how do you know me why don't you stand to your feet I want to pray over you I could just keep preaching and you guys are just like sitting there patiently like I'm loving this I feel like one of the greatest evangelistic tools you can have in your tool belt is actually the gift of prophecy. It is one of the quickest ways to display the love of God to someone. But please, this, this, uh, when we're prophesying to our community and outside of church, let's limit our Christianese language. Because they don't understand it. Use a vocabulary that they understand. I see God giving you a new wineskin. I'm like, what the? I thought you were from church. Like, what does that mean? What does that even mean? And you're talking to a tech person. Maybe God's giving them a new operating system. 
Same, same message, different language. Let's check our language and make sure we're, we're not an obstacle to the interpretation of what God's trying to speak to someone. Use their language. When Jesus rocks up on the scene, you, you watch him, and I, I love the way he showed up on the scene because he showed up and he spoke to people in their language. He spoke to people in their uh, things they were doing in regular life. Hey, you're a farmer? Hey, let me just talk to you about this, 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 this guy who's sowing seed in a field. Hey, hey, uh, you know your olive groves. Let's talk about uh, the wild branch being grafted in. You know, hey, you, you guys are shepherds. You guys have sheep. You know sheep, right? Well, I'm the great shepherd. You know how the sheep know the shepherd's voice? That's how it is with me and God. He used their language. He used the stuff they understood. You don't have to be fancy, and you don't have to sound super religious. Please take that off. It's not attractive, and it's actually a boundary for them. Now, notice I said God's giving you a new operating system. I didn't take God out of the equation. God's still right in the middle of it. He's still the gift giver of that thing. But I'm using a language that they understand where God's showing up and what he's doing. And I want you to take risks. I want you to have fun. God speaks many different ways. One of the exercises we do a lot of times is get a movie character for the person across from you. Why would you do that? Because that's the language of the community. They go to movies. They've seen movies. If they were a superhero, what superhero would they be and why? And you're like, you walk up to the barista at Starbucks and you're like, hey, you know what? When I walked up here, I looked at you and you reminded me of Batman. And, I, and I, when, I, when I saw you, I thought, man, you, you're so gifted. You have like Batman has that belt with all the cool stuff. You're so amazing. You're so incredible. What do you need to do? You didn't say, hey, thus saith the Lord, I'm going to prophesy over you right now and your life's going to be changed. No, I'm bringing you strength, courage, comfort. Start speaking a language people understand and start lifting your eyes. Lift your vision higher and you'll see the glory of the Lord in someone else. You'll see treasure in them. How many of you will commit to say, I'm going to challenge myself and start giving prophetic words? Courage, strength, comfort. Courage, strength, comfort. Some of you, you're going to get in a situation where you're like, oh no, there's that prophetic thing. And you're like, Will it work with this person? I don't know if it will. Listen, it will. It will. It, they, they're desperate for it. The world is desperate for an encounter with God. Father, would you stir us up? Would you fill us ag again with those three commodities, strength, courage, and comfort? And God, as we receive that from you, we, we just overflow in our life. We're to become an overflow expression of everything we do. That, that these, these church seats would begin to be overflowing with people who said, hey, someone yelled out to me my true identity. I was in this situation. I was in this place. I was in that bar and someone gave me not liquid courage, but real courage. They didn't give me artificial comfort. They gave me real comfort, the comfort I've never felt before. That's why I'm here. I don't know Jesus yet, but I know what I felt there. That's what I need. Lord, would you stir it within us and increase our capacity for your love to be poured out in our life and that we would flow with that love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you. As we close, and I know there's Mother's Day lunches and things. I just, I felt this, and I just want to do this, but I want to move it quickly. And, and if, I just felt like that there would, be, there's an impartation even on the prophetic. Um, and we're not going to come up and just lay hands, but what I felt is just, the, we'll line up just kind of this way. And I just feel like, uh, we're going to have Ben just 
if it's okay, just lay hands as you walk through. And, and I was seeing it like this. It's, you know, where Jesus says in John 4, hey, come, if, if you want this drink, you can drink of this. I've seen it in John 7 where it's just this, Jesus says, if anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And he's referring to the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts 19, I, was, I saw Paul, you see where Paul lays hands on, on them. It says, I'm not going to go back and preach all this. So it's just, but John, or Paul lays hands on him and it says this, and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. And, uh, and then it says, and then they entered the synagogue and they spoke boldly there for three months. There's like, there's this boldness that comes on us as well. And I, I just feel like there's an opportunity for just this impartation to receive something. And we, it, it's not necessarily like, <laughs> well, it can't be the laying on of hands. It's the Holy Spirit that comes in you. But there's just something that happens with the laying on of hands, this, this like, this, uh, I don't, I don't even, maybe you can explain it better. Uh, uh, well, I just want to say this. Uh, Second Timothy says, uh, Timothy, uh, Paul encourages Timothy, hey, stir up the gift of God that you receive through the laying on of hands. And so what we're going to do, um, the fastest way we can do this is that this would be a river, not, not, a, not a stagnant thing, and everyone would walk by, and you just, okay, I want to give you a pace, okay? So you're just walking by, and it, listen, Holy Spirit lives outside of time. He's not limited by time, and he can fill you with everything you need in the moment in a quick amount of time. So it, uh, quick, longer doesn't mean more. And if you take too long, I'll just take it back. No, I'm joking. Uh, but um, just, you know, keep a good flow on this. But I, here's what I, I know. I know there's going to be a gift released. But I know God knows you more than I know you. So I don't get to dictate exactly what it is he gives you, but he knows what you need. But I do know the, the, the mantle on my life and the office on my life as a prophet means I get to give the gift of prophecy and impart uh, a greater revelation of that. And so we're going we're gonna to release that. So if you can begin to line up right here and, and just come through. And, Pastor, if you could keep people flowing. So we're going to just come through here and connect this with the fathering and mothering. That's some, sometimes we think of prophetic as the, it's this, like, crazy thing up here. No, this is where you're going to be. You're going to speak as a spiritual father and mother to those that need that impartation, that those that need that encouragement and that strength and that courage. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. So, Lord, we just thank you as, as we're walking through. Lord, we thank you for this impartation of, of your heart. It's actually just having the Father's heart. And as you see someone, it's, it's, it's responding in love, the love of the Father to share what's on the Father's heart for the person that's in front of you. It's not that crazy. But Lord, we just thank you for this impartation of your love, of this uh, opportunity in a greater way. I just feel like it's not even, it's going to just break some things from you as, this, as he's just laying hands on you. It's just a... It's going to open up the dam that where maybe it's just held back because you're thinking about it too much. You're trying to, to get this entire like amazing word for someone before you go up and you just share the love of Jesus with them. You can just tell them they're loved. So Lord, we just thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you're opening the wells. Lord, that they, there would just be a gush of the Father's love over those around them. Thank you for fathers and mothers. You can be a spiritual father and a mother at any age, right? Any, you can be a spiritual father or mother at any age. You can speak into people's lives. Thank you, Jesus.
As you leave, God bless you, and we love you. Happy Mother's Day. Go in his grace and his love. You're all commissioned. <laughs>